Hey YouTube, I want to finish that video um, about coal stoves. So, I have some notes here on my computer so you'll see me looking that way and that's what I'm looking at. So, anyway, um, <clears throat> today was the first day of deer season in Pennsylvania for buck. You have to have three points on one side at least. I got soaked three times and I did not see any deer. I saw other, other animals but no deer today. So anyway, you know, wish me luck for tomorrow. Tomorrow's another day. Okay, so in continuing this video series about the coal, I want to talk today about the dirt associated with coal and ashes and things like that and what I do with them and, you know, you can take it from there. Uh, first of all, any kind of solid fuel stove is messy pellets. Now pellets aren't as messy as coal I don't think but you still have ashes. Um, what else I got here? Uh, wood is the same thing. You know any kind of solid fuel is dirty to a degree. Okay so how messy things are will depend on what type of stove you might want to get. I mean you know if you're if you're not wanting to do a lot of housekeeping you may not want to even have a solid fuel stove. You may want to go to something else or um, like a stove that's hand fired like the stoves that we have you know you have to maintain every day and you have also have to do some cleaning every day or every other day and um, if you don't want to do that something like a uh, pellet stove that you can fill up a bin or even a uh, stoker stove you could fill with coal might make the dirt happen once a week rather than every day when you take out the ashes and stuff so anyway, um, in this video, coal is my concern because coal is what we're talking about today. So first of all, um, you have to have coal delivered or you can pick it up. Now sometimes what I'll do if I don't want to spend a lot of money on coal, I'll take my pickup truck, stop at the coal yard on the way to town for whatever reason if I if my truck bed is empty and I'll get a half a ton of coal and then I'll just shovel it into the bin and like I said the other day depending on which truck I have sometimes I'll leave the truck sit in the garage and just take the coal right off of the truck so um, the, the other thing is that uh, like all other solid fuels coal should be kept dry it shouldn't be allowed to be wet now wet coal they wash coal, okay, so sometimes when you get it, it is wet from the coal yard. But, you know, it usually dries up fairly quickly. Although sometimes if you buy it in the dead of winter, you'll come home and if you buy it in a pickup truck, it'll be one big lump on the top, especially because it's frozen. But the coal yard that I buy from, it's not washed at that yard, it's just stored at that yard. But sometimes it, get, it may get some rain on it. It's not out in the open, but if you get water on coal, there's a, um, you know, it, it tends to um, not be a good thing. And I'll explain this to you. When you put damp wood on a fire, if the fire is hot and has nice hot coals, the wood will just steam up a little bit of water as it starts to burn. And, you know, it'll usually burn, if the, um, especially if the outside's just wet, but the inside's not. Like let's say the, um, I don't know, the, the moisture content in wood, I don't know what it's supposed to be for, for firewood actually. It might be 10 to 18 percent or something like that. And if it is, it'll burn um, slowly, a little slower than dry wood if it's, you know, if it's not dry, if it's wet. But nonetheless, it'll still burn. Coal burns as well, but here's the problem with coal. So imagine you have a nice coal fire going, red hot coals, and you want to bank it up for the night, so you're going to put coal on there. If the coal is wet and you throw buck, you throw shovels of coal on there, you get a really bad sulfur smell when the coal is wet. Okay, and also if you put if if the fires depending on the heat of the fire underneath the coal. You can put a lot of coal on, like maybe six shovels of coal on, and all of a sudden you'll get a burst of sulfur-laden steam in your face coming out the door. 
So what you want to do is you want to make sure that the damper on the stove pipe, that little valve, that flat pl flapper valve, is wide open when you put coal on or when you're shaking the ashes because that will help to pull some of that um, dust into the stove and keep, it, keep the steam and the sulfur from coming out of the door and into the room. Because um, when you put coal on a fire, like if, my, if I'm outside working and my wife put coal, puts coal on the fire, I know she put it on because I can smell it. It's not really, it's, it's not a pleasant odor. It's nothing like, you know, hickory burning, for instance. It's not pleasant, but it's, it's bearable and it doesn't last that long. As soon as the coal gets hot, the smell goes away. It's that initial drying the coal or burning up the little bit of coal particles that are on the lumps of coal that give you that initial odor. Okay, So that may be a factor for you. It depends on where you live. But where we're at, it's not an issue. Um, let's see here. Okay, so then um, I keep my coal in a coal bin. And I've, if you've watched my videos, you've seen the bin. All it is is a cement block. <coughs> I think it's 4 by 8 cement block about six courses high. Um, I put re, uh, ties in that and rebar in that to keep it together so it doesn't come apart. And I have that sitting on top of a six inch concrete slab. And then I built a wooden framed roof and stuff with a membrane on top of it to keep the coal fairly dry. Now this doesn't mean that moisture can't get to the coal, but water can't get to the coal. Okay, so you know, that's what you might want to do. Now, um, the cheapest way to handle coal is to just take it, bring it to the property, and have the guy dump it on a tarp. The problem with that is, is you can imagine what it's like in winter time because if you have snow mixed with coal, it's not good because when you throw it onto the fire, you end up with this really bad sulfur smell that's worse when it's wet or if you have some snow in a bucket of coal and then you have the water that what happens is you get a bucket of coal out of the uh, out of my bin like if I got a bucket the coal, the snow if if there was snow on it there's not in the bin but if there was snow melts the water goes to the bottom the coal bins the coal bucket is in the house then where it's fairly warm so it's water then and as you get to the bottom of the coal bucket you're getting that wet coal and you can't be throwing it away. I mean you can try and dump the water off of it but it just gets messy. You end up with this black mess of water trying to deal with it. So you want to keep the coal dry in all the processes of getting it from your coal bin into the house. Okay? So let me see here. Um, let's see. Um, Coal used to be $97 a ton. Now, I'm talking about the price of coal. And it doesn't matter what kind of coal it was. Peat coal, not coal, stove coal. And the different brands are, depends on the size of it. I use peat coal, which is equivalent to about a half to three quarter inch stone size. Um, nut coal is a little bigger than that. It all depends on the grates in your stove. I can burn pea or nut, but nut coal is bigger and it's a little harder for Sally to deal with and get it to burn right. So pea, because it's a little finer, gives us a nice better burn. In fact, you know, in power plants when they burn coal, they don't use coal like we use. It's actually pulverized coal because it burns really fast, okay, when it's pulverized. In fact, you can make an explosive from coal if you pulverize it first. They used to use coal oil, I think my grandfather told me, in mines to actually uh, make an explosive. But I'm not here to teach you about explosives. Um, but anyway, so this price of $97 a ton was like $97 a ton for 20 years. I used to go to, go to a place called the Tamaqua Coal Pockets and get coal. And for 20 years it was $97 a ton. It might have moved like from... I don't know if I'm 80 to 97 in those 20 years. But when Mr. Obama got to be the president, the coal went from $97 a ton to $230 a ton. Why? I don't know. And I don't really care. But anyway, um, 
As I said in previous videos, I use three tons of coal will get me through a winter. So, all right, so anyway, when it comes to coal, there's three separate operations to coal that makes dirt. Okay, now, we're I'm answering the questions of somebody who is concerned about the dust from coal getting on things like furniture or your clothing or even, you know, breathing in some of the dust. So, the one thing is when you put coal into the five gallon bucket to get it into the house. Now, that's how I operate. I take the coal out of the bin, put it in five gallon buckets, store nine buckets on my front porch, and then I dump it into the coal scuttle, and then I shovel it into the stove. So, there's a couple of places there where there can be dirt. But the main three things are getting the coal into a bucket, shoveling the coal onto the stove, and then taking the ashes out, which is the biggest dirty factor, okay, as far as dust goes. Now, when you're putting coal on, like I said before, you're putting coal on or you're taking, you're shaking the ashes, you want to open the damper on the stovepipe, and that'll help to pull everything into the stove rather than to let it blow out of the stove. But nonetheless, on a stove, when you take the ash pan out, you have to take a small shovel and shovel whatever fell into the area where the ash pan sits so that you can get the ash pan back in. That one, that's when the most amount of dirt is because you're taking the shovel, you're scooping up ashes, and you're dumping them into a pan in your living room. Now, it's not real bad. It's not like there's a dust plume that you can't see, but nonetheless, it's dusty. And... Um, what Sally was telling me, I asked her about this because I really didn't know. Sally told me that she has to dust every two days. She dusts the end tables, the, you know, window sills. She has a Swiffer thing for the floor. You know, she has to dust every two days if she's going to keep it neat. Now, you know, I guess depending upon, you know, who you are and how you do things, you you got to take it from there. Okay, so uh, then... Um, like I say, the dust uh, in the house comes like from shoveling the coal in and also from taking the ashes out. Now think about that. If you had a bigger ash pan, or if you had a bin that could hold more coal, you're doing that cycle less often, which means you're talking about less dirt. So, you know, a stove that, uh, like a stoker stove that you dump coal in a bin, I think they hold 40 pounds or something like that, it's not a bad thing. Now, let me give you a couple other particulars while I'm thinking about the 40-pound uh, stoker. A bucket of coal weighs around three, uh, 30 pounds. So you can figure 30 into 2,000. Well, let me just see what that would be here real quick. I can't do math and talk. Divided by uh, 30. So a ton of coal is... Um, A ton of coal is 66 buckets. Now I usually figure 30 buckets to a half a ton of coal, but it's actually 30, 30 plus buckets to a half a ton. So you're looking at roughly 65 buckets, just rounding it off, of coal in a ton. So, you know, I can have this down to a science because I've been burning coal for so long. Like we, we use normally a bucket and about a third every day. So we use about 35 pounds of coal a day. So I know that coal lasts me almost a month, you know, a ton of coal, or, or it lasts a month. I, I'm not positive of that, but I, I know, where, you know how to figure it out. Okay, so then the other thing, let's see, we got uh, the ashes. Uh, it's getting rid of the ashes. Um, you have to have a place to get rid of ashes, okay? Now, years ago, when I was a kid, you, they used to have ash bucket or ash uh, um, cans that were kind of short, squarish looking, and people would fill them up, set them outside, and when the garbage man came, he would take these ashes and dump them in the, or, or not the garbage man, but a, another truck that would pick up ashes, would take the ashes, dump them into that truck, and then they take those ashes to the municipal or borough building, stockpile them, and they would use them for ashes for on the road. But that was when almost everybody burned coal. You know, there was a time when, when I was a little kid 
where we lived, nobody had diesel fuel, nobody burned propane, you know, very few people, mostly everybody burned coal or wood. So there was a lot of coal ashes to be had, you know, for the townships and stuff when everybody was burning coal. Now, not so much. Okay, so then when I go to get rid of um, ashes, what do I do with them? Well, I, I said it before, I'll say it again just to clarify. I take the ashes out of the pan, out of, I pull the pan out of the stove, I take the shovel, clean the compartment out where the ashes are, put them into the container, the ash, can, ash pan that's in the stove, take that out to the ash can, C-A-N, Sally dumps it, and Sally does this mostly. Sally dumps the ashes into the can, and then from there, I take them, and I'll either do one or two things with them. I'll either throw them on the icy road if the driveway's really icy, and the road is 500 feet long to get to my to the stop sign. Of course, there's not a stop sign there; it's just a T. But to get up there is like 500 feet, so it can use up that container plus of ashes. So I'll use it for the driveway to get out of the driveway and stuff. Or, if there's no ice, I'll take that container and put it and use it as structural backfill. In other words, I'll put that wherever I'm going to build my next project. And I've already started doing that because I want to add on to the garage another 12 feet. And I started putting ashes there. And that will level that up for me. When ashes get wet, they pack really well. You know, they're not, they actually make clay a better product as far as um, stability goes. You know how clay like you know is sort of soft when it's wet. When there's ashes mixed with it, it actually stabilizes the clay a little. Okay? So that's what I do with it. Um, I would recommend that you know if you're gonna if you're gonna try to get rid of ashes, depending upon the size of your property, I mean, usually you can find a place to put ashes that you want to level something up. I've put ashes like underneath concrete sidewalks, underneath uh, the greenhouse there's ashes, there's ashes under this garage floor. Um, you know, wherever I know I'm going to be building something, I'll put ashes just to put, just for fill. And you'd be surprised over a year or two, you know, with this is long-term planning, over a year or two you'll have things leveled up and ashes are very easy to shovel. They're easy to dig, so you can do it by hand, and you can rake them easy. Of course, when they're frozen, forget it. You can't move them at all. And ashes freeze like a rock, especially after you leave them outside, because they're so dry from coming out of the stove that they absorb moisture right out of the air, and they, they freeze up like a brick in the wintertime. Okay, so what else I got here? Um, oh, and I don't recommend that you put ashes where you have, like, flowing water. Because then you, you run the risk of ashes leaching down to a lower place. You know, they say that water from here ends up in the, the Chesapeake Bay. Now, you know, I can't be worrying about the people in Chesapeake Bay. I'm worried about myself up here. However, I do respect the fact that, you know, you don't want water. Even with my backhoe, sometimes if I get a drip or something, you know, you try to contain it as best you can. I soak it up or, you know, get put it into a bag and get rid of it. But you don't want anything leaching off your property. That's all I'm saying. So I don't put it where water runs. Uh, let's see. I said about the clay. Oh, and uh, what I was going to say also about the clay is, is when you mix ashes with clay, especially when you're using it to, you know, for a structural backfill, it really compacts well. So when you run a tamper over it or a roller, it really gets hard. So that's a good thing as far as construction goes. And then we have what's known as the toxicity of coal ashes. Now, I'm not here to debate environmentalists, and I'm not going to get into a, ba a debate with an environmentalist, especially a wackoed one that's way, way out there not knowing the facts about things and taken for granted that because, um, what, Al Gore said something that this is what we're going to follow. I'm not, I don't play that game. So I'm not going to be arguing with environmentalists, but I will say this. The EPA of this country has deemed coal ashes 
not hazardous material. Okay, not hazardous material. Now I think they did that in 2015 and the environmentalists, you know, were throwing a fit about that because they wanted it to be considered, and like with Obama going from 97 to $230 a ton. I don't know what their agenda is. I really don't care. Really, I don't. All I want to do is get coal, heat the house. That's what I care about. I'm just telling you what happened is a byproduct to what was happening with us. Now, the thing is, is um, you can believe what I said or not about coal ashes not being a hazardous material. Look it up. That's from the EPA. However, you know, we handle so many toxic things in one day, it isn't even funny. I was reading an article about talcum powder where some lady and some guy put it on their private places for whatever reason, I guess, to freshen things up or something. But anyway, they ended up suing Johnson & Johnson for millions of dollars because they got some kind of a thing, you know, toxicity of some sort in their system claiming that, or cancer, claiming that it was from the talcum powder. So, whether it's true or not, I don't know, but I took with talcum powder, I know what, what we did on all our kids. So, and I sometimes use it myself, yet. So, talcum powder, and then we, we also handle liquid fuels. I read an article uh, one time where this bio uh, fuel that we use, this um, ethanol, ethanol puts more pollutants at ground level than gasoline ever did. So, why? I, I don't understand this stuff. I'm not the scientist. If I was the scientist behind it, I would explain to you why that does that or does not do that. So I don't know. But anyway, um, so they don't. So what I was saying here is they don't know the rest of the story. And if they don't know the story, they can't talk intelligently about it. Okay. Um, so anyway, uh, ashes that we handle, the small amount that we handle, do not seem to be a hazard to me. And I don't, I don't think it that way. Uh, the other thing I'll say is um, coal ashes, when they're burned, okay, I'm getting away from the hazardous part now. When coal ashes are burned, if you have, um, you, you get one-ninth roughly volume and weight of ashes compared to the coal. Okay, so in other words, if you have a ton, well for me, I use three tons of coal a year. So three tons of coal gives me 667 pounds of ashes. And roughly, I have here that that's about eight bags of sacre. So that's how many ashes you get from three tons of coal. Now three tons of coal will fit in an area four by four by eight. So, you know, one ninth the size of the actual coal is what the ashes take up. And usually what I end up in a year, the 40-gallon the, uh, gas, or a 40-gallon um, uh, coal uh, garbage buckets, metal garbage buckets that I use for a coal bin, or coal cans, is probably, probably I get three full ones a year out of that. And it's really not hard to get rid of them. I mean, I can put them, you know, somewhere, rake it out to two inches, and you know, hardly know what's even there. And then cap that with dirt. So, um, what I want to say about this and, you know, the toxicity and stuff like that and any kind of hazards is this. Um, if there's anything that life has taught us, now I'm talking to you people that are my age. If there's anything that life has taught us, it is that any, too much of anything is no good, okay? Too much of anything. Too much good food, too much water. You ever hear of water intoxi intoxication? So you have water intoxication from too much water. You eat too much food, you get all kinds of freaking problems from that. And um, so what that means, it means is don't eat or, or breathe in ashes. Now you might think that's funny, but I was reading an article where people in Russia were eating ashes for some reason, thinking they're getting something from it. I don't know what they're getting. I wonder how many ashes Putin eats, though. I'd like to know that. But anyway, um, yeah, so, let's see, what do I have here? Oh, don't breathe in ashes. So in other words, when you're shoveling, you know, don't be making any more of a mess than you have to. Don't spill the freaking shovel on the floor or whatever, just get it right into the ash pan as quickly 
neatly and without a big mess that you can. And my wife watches me take out the ashes and she has a fit if I get, if she sees any kind of dust plume anywhere, and I'm not talking about a great big thing, but she just don't, don't be making dust. That's what she tells me. So anyway, um, ashes from industrial coal plants, we're talking about major users, users of coal, thousands and thousands of tons of coal or maybe millions of tons, I don't know. But anyway, their ashes are used, some of them, I think, I think I was reading, it was either 30 or 60 percent of their ashes are used for concrete and are used for gypsum wallboard, believe it or not. So then what's happening there is we're using coal that we've already got a system in place of using to make gypsum so we don't have to dig more gypsum mines. This is what I read, you know, whether that's true or false or makes any sense, I don't know. I'm just relaying some information to you guys so you can look it up. As far as concrete goes, they actually claim, excuse me, that ashes make concrete harder. In fact, they were saying, I was reading an article that said the, um, one of them gladiator things in Rome was actually built using volcanic ash, and that's been sitting there for thousands of years. So anyway, also, in Pennsylvania, a study I read claimed that there's enough anthracite coal, imagine this, enough anthracite coal in the, in the state of Pennsylvania to heat every man, woman, and child for the next 500 years. That's a major, major um, resource. So why government is taxing the daylights out of them, I don't know, I guess it's because they want money from everybody, they're just going after whoever they can. I mean, it's getting ridiculous. Thank God Trump is changing some of that stuff and reducing some of the uh, fees and fines on some of those ridiculous things. I'm not against the environment, guys. I'm for the environment. But I'm not for, you know, you spill a freaking... Um, quart of gas on the ground and we need 500 people there to determine what to do with it. I'm not for that. The best thing to do is light it with a match. Anyway, um, also, besides it being a major resource, my grandfather was a coal miner at the Jetto Highland uh, Coal Place, I think, in um, near Hazleton, somewhere, Pennsylvania, when I was a kid. So that's one of the reasons that I'm partial to coal. Uh, so with that, I hope you enjoyed these series of videos. It is very hard for me to get to the mill right now simply because it's been raining almost every day. We had one day of sun this week. I'm telling you, I have never seen weather like this in my whole life. There is hardly no sun. So, and it was snowing a little bit ago. It stopped, so I had asked the girl that's watching my weather for us up in Michigan. I told her it was starting to snow here and apparently she changed the cha or changed the weather pattern for us. So now I don't have any snow, just a dusting, but it's supposed to snow at 4 o'clock in the morning. I don't know what's going to happen. So anyway guys, have a good one. Um, I thank you for watching these videos and um, if there's anything that I could maybe do that you would like to, to uh, know about, you know, don't be afraid to ask or mention it. And uh, oh, I had gotten a couple comments about um, the house and things like that. Um, guys, I, a lot of times I build stuff to keep myself busy. And that house at this point is one of them. So I use that to keep myself busy. I have already in the works designs for all kinds of furniture. I have designs for adding on to my garage. I have designs for building a garage up there next to the White House. So, you know, I'm always building something. That's what I do. I like doing it. It's Kind of like somebody tying flies or working on cars, and I even do that. I just enjoy staying busy when I can. Now, naturally, at my age, things go wrong at times, but for the most part, I'm pretty busy. Anyway, guys, have a good one.